as you will note from our title and section 19, we're moving on to a new subject, negotiating ocean contracts with both carriers and NVOCCs. We have some pretty detailed stuff in these upcoming sections, so let's buckle down to get some work done. Let's begin by saying that U.S. importers can negotiate ocean import service contracts directly with steamship lines. We've said that a number of times. It shouldn't come as any big surprise. U.S. ocean importers can also negotiate contracts with NVOCCs, those non-vessel operating common carriers. Let's say now that the two are not mutually exclusive, meaning that if an importer negotiates contracts with a steamship line, they can't work with an NVOCC or vice versa. Many importers, in fact, do mix and match, have a couple of maybe one or two ocean contracts with a steamship line, as well as one with an NVOCC. That's a strategic decision. As it relates to our second bullet point, and the negotiation of contracts with NVOCCs, we talked about this previously, there is an NVOCC service arrangement, which is a longer term agreement, typically a year, for a fixed amount of containers, a thousand TEU maybe, not to be confused with what we also spoke about, the NVOCC rate arrangement, which is not a contract, but more of a quotation, a one-off, as it is sometimes called. A service arrangement is a longer-term deal. A rate arrangement could be a one-time deal with an NVOCC to move one container. Third bullet point, historically, large importers negotiated directly with the steamship lines. You will recall a supply chain perspective where we mentioned about the gentleman's agreement between steamship lines and NVOs and where the steamship lines would work with the big importers and the NVOs would work with the small to medium-sized enterprises. That's still somewhat the case, but those lines have been blurred rather dramatically. As a trade tip, the minimum volume requirement for contracts with steamship lines is at an all-time low, which is to say that an importer could go and negotiate a contract for 50 TEU with a steamship line. 15 years ago, that was unheard of. So that's changed a lot as well. But again, the importer has the option of working with carriers and or NVOCCs for negotiation of ocean contracts. Rate negotiations for FCL contracts are based on geography and or volume commitments from the importer. The geography just means what are the port pairs? Is it Yantian to LA? Is it Rotterdam to New York? That's what we mean by geography. And the volume commitment is how many containers, how many TEU are going to be contracted for. As a quick side note, FCL contracts can be for dry and or refrigerated containers. Clearly, we've been talking more about dry cargo for omni-channel distribution, but one can contract for reefer containers, as they're called, also. Third bullet, and we'll see much more detail on this in an upcoming section, but contracts also contain the service provisions. It's not just how many TEU and what the price is. There are transit time commitments, the types of equipment required, 20 footers, 40 footers, 40 high cubes and such, and the need for equipment availability. Contracting for space on a ship is one thing. Getting containers and getting those containers on the ships is another story entirely. There has to be explicit verbiage about equipment availability. Last bullet, we mentioned this briefly a moment ago, the duration of an ocean contract is normally for one year. And here in the United States, as a side note, that negotiation period is right around the March-April time frame, which will run for a 12-month period to the following March-April time frame. Something to note here, first bullet, pricing for LCL contracts can be on an all-in basis or port-to-port, CY-to-CY. Kind of all-inclusive pricing versus just a port-to-port -port move. Second bullet, the pricing found in an FCL contract will depend on the type of service. That's where the differentiation comes in of what the charges may and may not be. Port to port, we just said, that's kind of the basic container yard to container yard move. An FCL move could be on a door to port basis, which means the rate includes the drayage from the factory at origin and the ocean transportation to the port of discharge. You could switch that around and have a service that goes from port to door, where the vendor pays the drayage up to the port of export, the port of loading, 
and then the ocean freight to the importer includes the actual main mode of transport that ocean freight but also the domestic move from the first port of arrival to an inland destination that's called port to door and then door to door is from the door of the factory to the door at destination which of these is chosen is going to have a huge impact on what the rates are going to look like trade tip importers must have a clear understanding of all ancillary charges related to a contract that's really quite important because sometimes the ocean freight itself can be the shiny object a very attractive rate but there's all these extra charges that make things extra expensive we as importers have to be aware of that and be in a position to negotiate those rates and have them included in our contract last slide in this section we can't forget LCL cargo. U.S. importers can also negotiate LCL contracts with NVOCCs. And just like we'll have full container rates for 10 port pairs for goods coming into the United States, we can negotiate a per cubic meter rate for LCL cargo too. That's very common. Second bullet, the steamship lines that feature their own logistics arms, which we've spoken of, also offer LCL service. They'll offer groupage boxes too. Contracts similar to FCL are negotiated on a geographic that port pair and or quantity basis but in this case for LCL we're not talking about number of TEU we're talking about numbers of cubic meters that's the unit of measure as we know for LCL cargo if we as an importer go to negotiate LCL rates with an NVOCC we have to be able to tell them that we have 2,000 cubic meters a year coming out of Ningbo going into the port of Portland, for example. That's the unit of measure. Of course, that's what we're going to use. And naturally, second to the last bullet, rates are based on that per cubic meter basis. Once again, as a trade tip, LCL freight is notorious for ancillary charges. Be sure to understand all extra charges associated with an LCL contract. Don't fall for that shiny object, $40 a cubic meter, because the extra charges could be substantial. That will be that for this section. And when we come back, as you'll note in this slide, we're going to go through the typical clauses found in an ocean carrier service contract and then show excerpts from a real ocean contract in the upcoming section.